Uh, looking at the program book, I, I discovered I have a unique uh, distinction amongst all the speakers. I have the longest first name of all the... <laughs> in fact, my name is so long, TEDx had to put it in two lines. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, global warming. We all know we have to do something about it. And we also know the planet has been warming over the last 100 years. And particularly in the last few decades, it's been changing in unpredictable ways. The good thing is that the, all the world leaders, almost all of them, acknowledge we have to do something about it. But they're gridlocked. I'm not going to go into all the reasons why they're gridlocked, but they are. We have not done much. So, and the situation gets more and more difficult when we look at this whole problem, how much needs to be done. Basically, then we are in a mess. But I'm going to talk to you today about a new approach where we can get out of this mess. Okay. But before I describe that to you, I have to take you to my grandmother's kitchen. And later you'll realize what the connection is. I used to visit her in India almost every summer. I was a teenager. That's not a picture of me as a teenager. It was just <laughs> taken two years ago. She used to cook wonderful, delicious meals. But it was a pain to watch her see cooking with the traditional mud stoves, with all the biomass fuels, cow dung and firewood. The kitchen would be filled with smoke. She takes about a couple of hours to cook because she has six sons and a lot of grandkids. And at the end of it, she'll spend an hour with a racking cough. And, and she had dozens of grandchildren. I was her favorite one. That's why I'm talking about her here. <laughs> it's rather bizarre that my work in climate change in the US last 35 years has taken me back to her kitchen with the realization if I solve her problem, I can find a solution to the global warming problem. Okay? So much so that I mounted a major international research program. I now shuttle between villages in India and my laboratory here at Scripps where I find sophisticated ways to observe the atmosphere. That's where some unique new ideas are starting to take flight. These UAVs, or unmanned aerial vehicles, are part of a new arsenal for climatologist V. Ramanathan of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I think of these UAVs as the future. This is the way they're going to be observing the planet. They were recently part of a groundbreaking study on the Maldive Islands, just off the southern coast of India. So, back to the kitchen. It turns out my grandmother was not alone in cooking with biomass. Even now, about three and a half billion rely on this biomass for fuel and these kind of traditional mud stoves simply because either they can't afford fossil fuels or they have no access to it. Just watch next what happens to this smoke, individual smoke. It becomes massive brown clouds, what I call brown clouds, sometimes covering an entire continent, entire ocean. And this basically contains particulates, what we see in the LA smog and ozone. There are two, particular, two pollutants here, one I call black carbon. It's the same black stuff which comes out of diesel trucks. And ozone, which is in smog, are major contributor to global warming. So I became obsessed with studying this the last 10 years and documenting their impacts. They cause over half a million deaths just from inhalation, indoor and outdoor. They cause millions of tons of crop damages. And because this black carbon is an enormously efficient trapping of sunlight, they contribute to melting of glaciers in addition to global warming, disruption of the monsoon, rainfall, and the list goes on and on. And on. So clearly I realized the problem is a lot more severe than what I had thought or the world thought about this whole pollutants. 
and I was frustrated. We were not taking any action on it. So help came to me from higher up. I got invited to join the Vatican Academy of Science. I was admitted to it by Pope John Paul directly, one of the biggest honors I've had. And so after, as you know, this pope passed away, I've been working on the next book, uh, Pope Benedict, through the Vatican to organize a working group on climate change. So we just released a report just this April documenting the alarming things happening to our glacier. This is the one in Himalayas, picture taken in 1921. And now you can see how the glaciers melted from glacial lakes. And this was provided to me by David Brashears, one of the famous Mount Everest climbers. And it's happening worldwide. This is in the Peruvian glaciers, 1978. Now, like that's what I said. The thing is accelerating the last 20, 30 years in completely unpredictable ways. So how do we get our hands on the problem? There are two major pollutants. One is carbon dioxide. You've all heard about this. Anything you burn, firewood, gasoline, coal, ultimately all becomes carbon dioxide. It's one of the most insidious, it's colorless, one of the most insidious pollutants simply because once you release them, about 50% stays in the air for 100 years from now. So whatever you release in your car will be there for your great-great-grandchildren. And about 20% stays there for 1,000 years or more. So the thing is just accumulating, covering the planet like a blanket, and traps the heat and warms the planet. Basic quantum mechanics, basic physics. But to solve that problem, we had to cut down its emission by at least 50%. Transformational change in the way we use energy, and the cost estimate is $46 trillion. So that's why we are stuck, okay? Fortunately, we don't have to remain stuck. About half, 40% of the warming comes from this other pollutant, the one I showed you in that smoke. Soot, methane gas comes out of, you know, you're cooking, ozone, smog, and fluorocarbons. I'm not going to touch on all that. The beauty of this ugly pollutants is that there are technologies available to get rid of them, okay? They're cost effective, and if you turn them off today, the emissions of soot, for example, their effect is gone two weeks from now. So we can see quick effect. That's what people want. And the good thing about California is California is a leader in such technologies. I'm going to focus on the cookstove thing. And we initiated this project, Surya, changing the traditional cookstove to the improved cookstoves. I'm going to show you that in the movie. And we came up with innovative way, cell phone, this is Qualcomm after all, to be able to monitor the pollution in thousands of homes. In fact, some of this work was funded by Qualcomm. This is a cell phone development. Let's watch the movie about what's... Sixteen-year-old Shabnam lives in Kheratpur village, located in the Indo-Gangetic plains of North escapes. India. In an agricultural economy, most families here live on less than a dollar a day. There is little access to basic amenities, be it health, education, or even electricity. Most girls drop out before completing high school only to take on the mantle of household chores. Shabnam spends several hours inside a smoke-filled kitchen. Inhaling the smoke puts her at a high risk of contracting diseases like asthma, tuberculosis and cancer. The suit on the walls is only a small reminder of what might be in the lungs of rural women who spend hours in this space. I have experienced this personally. You know, my grandmother in the village in South India, where I come, originally come from, used to cook with these mud stoves, and I have experienced them. I know what it did to my grandmother. So we have to solve this problem. Project Surya, named from the Sanskrit word for sun, is on one level an experiment to measure how the atmosphere responds to the removal of smoke and soot particles 
that typically color the sky in this region of India's Uttar Pradesh state. It is also a demonstration of how people in many developing countries could live healthier lives while making an immediate impact on climate change. In October 2009, after more than two years of gathering support and financing, Ramanathan and collaborators from the Energy and Resources Institute in India distributed efficient, low-emission cookers and solar-powered lanterns to households in the village of Kairatpur, located south of the Indian city of Lucknow. Most village residents live below the poverty line, gathering sticks, wood, and cow dung to make fires in homemade stoves. Now, during the first phase of Surya, these residents will serve as collaborators, deploying air filters in their houses and transmitting data through supplied cell phones. We want to uh, take a large region of at least about five to 10,000 homes with a population of 30 to 50,000, switch the cooking, essentially create a black carbon hole and capture that with some of the most sophisticated instruments we have ever deployed, both in each of the homes, making measurements inside of air pollution and black carbon, measured outside, and we also want to monitor this region with satellites. So, we are now getting started. We have finished one village, and we have shown we can cut down this pollution by 70%. They still get to use the biomass, which is free for them. And it cuts their cooking down, at least by a factor of two. So the women have more gainful things to do. And so now we want to demonstrate on a larger scale. Ultimately, there are many, many, many such projects we can do individually. We don't have to wait for the governments. Basically, I'm thinking about like an Occupy Planet scale. People get involved but we need a personal reason. My personal reason, I'm holding it right there. Leave the planet better for our grandchildren. You can see that I'm smiling and I'm confident. My granddaughter, she is skeptical. She's thinking, <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Thank you. <laughs>